Hey, everybody, we are back with another episode of Can't Stop Snapping, the official podcast of MarvelSnapZone.com. Uh, you may be wondering, why is this episode a day late? Uh, that is an interesting question. And that is because the new card this week, High Evolutionary, which we will be breaking down in this episode, came out late. So we will be talking a little bit about what that all looked like and the communication from Second Dinner. But to break it all down, I am joined by, uh, you know, very popular guest and returning guest, Teddy Ninja. Teddy, thanks for being here. Hey, it's incredible to be here. So, yeah, so we got Hi Evo a day late, but he is not a dollar short. This guy yes. is the full package. Oh, man. I am well, so excited to break it all down. And for the context of the listeners, you and me have been chatting, obviously, the last couple of days on Discord. Yeah, we're like, yeah. when are we going to record this? And we could have recorded last night, but we said, do we really only want two hours to have played with the card before we record this? No, let's give it another 24 so we can really kind of see what's going on here. So yeah, we will dive right into things with High Evolutionary. So um, before we kind of break down the card, break down the synergies with this card and, and his friends, his cast of friends, if you will. Uh, I just want to talk about a little bit what happened this week. So, uh, you know, depending on the time zone you're in, I'm in mountain time in the U.S. So 9 p.m. is when things reset for me in the shop. Uh, so it was 9 p.m. on Tuesday or no, 9 p.m. on Monday. Yep. Uh, everybody was expecting High Evolutionary to pop up in the shop. And one of two things happened. If you had purchased Howard the Duck last week, you got a blank spot with no card. And if you had not purchased Howard the Duck, you had Howard the Duck still. Uh, and everybody went crazy, you know, all the content creators, I was like pulling up different people's streams to see, did anybody get him? I didn't get him, you know, like, yeah. and nobody, nobody had him. So, uh, second dinner had to work through some solution on their end, which delayed his release by two days. Uh, but we, here we are. And you said the statement, you know, not a dollar short, uh, so far it's a lot of fun. Want to turn it over to you. General impressions of high evolutionary. It's a banger. Oh man. <laughs> It feels reminiscent to Thanos in that it is changing so much, bringing all these different tools and you get to figure out how they interact with everything else in the catalog. There's a lot of different looks that High Evolutionary can throw. And I think it's going to take a while to be able to optimize the lists. And because in the comparison to Thanos, Thanos took was a slow starter, right? He was a late yep. bloomer. Everybody yep. was way more hyped about Galactus for a while, so much so that the devs were buffing him right when the community figured out how to unlock him. And we had this horrible mismatch for like, Two weeks um here with high evolutionary just hitting the ground running it is very exciting for what this card can do <laughs> and it's been like non-stop mirror matches as well so it feels like kitty released but everybody actually paid the tokens here this is how hyped this card has been i oh, think yes. when I, I got him within minutes of his release i probably played for two hours before i played a non-high evolutionary deck <laughs> so evaluating the card now is still a little bit challenging because I feel like we're in a we're in the housing the, bubble of just yeah. high Evo mirror matches. And it, once that bursts, we'll finally get to compare them against other lists. Yeah, it's so many things, so many thoughts are going through my brain as you're saying all this. I think this is what Second Dinner wants a card release to feel like. Yeah. Obviously, like, it's just like every card can't be this level of awesome and probably power level uh, or uniqueness. Uh, you know, I would love to say that every card that comes out this week, we're all equally hyped for, but I think it's just been kind of pros and cons. It's been fun to see everybody trying out different things and everybody buying the card. I think everybody was saving their tokens for this card. Right. Yeah. And I was the same thing as you as I was playing the first night he's available and it was just match after match, after match, after match, uh, which again, pros and cons. It was fun, but also then everybody's kind of playing him, but also counters to him. And we'll get into that. And it's like, is this really good or is everybody just kind of lost and kind of winging it and we're <laughs> having some success, right? We're lost, uh, we're lost in the sauce. I will say that it got to accentuate all the love that they put into the animations, which I was oh, not yes. expecting. To yes. see the thing throw a fire hydrant at Luke Cage and then it bounces off him, that was... I laughed so hard. It's There's yeah. so much love in all of these cards that they put in. On the animations alone, I feel like he's worth the purchase. Yeah uh super fun i you know just to see a little animation at the beginning of every every game with high evolutionary i guess just for listeners i'm assuming you know i always put this out there because uh, i assume everybody who's listening to this podcast is deep in marvel snap lore and knows what this card is and what it does and it's stat line but we'll we'll cover that really quick so my high evolutionary is a four cost four power card with the ability 
at the start of the game, unlock the potential of your cards with no abilities. So you may wonder, what the heck does that mean? Uh, well, it's all of the cards that generally synergize with Patriot in a Patriot style deck all have a new ability with uh, High Evolutionary. And you don't need to have High Evolutionary in play. You just need to have him in your deck to have these cards have their ability. So we'll really quickly break this down. They're on the screen if you're watching the podcast. But for those listening, Wasp is a zero one. Well, they're all the same stat line. Wasp's ability is on reveal. Afflict two random en enemy cards here with minus one power. Misty Knight is when you end a turn with unspent energy, give another friendly card plus one power. Shocker on reveal. Give the leftmost card in your hand minus one cost. Uh, Cyclops, when you end a turn with unspent energy, afflict two random enemies here with minus one power. The Thing on reveal, afflict a random enemy card here with minus one power. Repeat this twice more. Abomination costs one less for each enemy card in play that's afflicted with negative power. And Hulk, ongoing, plus two power for each turn you ended with unspent energy. Um, there's All a right, lot. Michael, let's, let's do it. What's the tier list? Uh, what is, do we want to start at the bottom or start at the top? My favorite thus far has been Hulk. Oh, getting to see him actually smash. Oh, it feels yeah. so much better. Yeah, <laughs> and I, they put all the love into his animation already, his voice line, etc. But when he hits the board at twenty, it just feels different than twelve. Yeah, uh, I don't know if he's the best. I'm not saying that, but definitely, I've just had some fun. I've been doing some shenanigans with uh, She Hulk and Hulk and Moon Girl and yes. Quinjet and you know skipping turn five. Anyway, I end up yeah with a sixteen or twenty power Hulk and a She Hulk. Or two, depending on you know how the locations land and what I've got in play, and it just feels good. It feels good yeah. to throw that thirty power down on the last turn of the game. Hulk and She Hulk together on the board. Hulk uh, family with the dirty thirty. It's a great look. So yeah. obviously, Hulk and Abomination. Those are your finishers. Everything else kind of builds to propping them up, either discounting a bomb or making Hulk more powerful by giving you these passing opportunities, or at least providing you with extra value for being able to pass energy, which normally you would never want to do. I yeah. think Cyclops was the huge out of left field in the early. I was keeping a little read on what people were saying. Everybody was discounting Cyclops, saying that oh, he doesn't feel that good compared to the rest of the suite. I think Cyclops is fantastic. And I find yeah. that setting him up in the mid game to be able to get the debuffs. And then in the early evaluations, I was seeing people nitpick on him versus the thing, right? The thing hits one enemy card and then repeats so he can get the full value even against one enemy. Cyclops guaranteed to hit two different enemies. The guarantee of actually spreading it helps Abomination even more. So that was kind of a nuance there that I don't think people were feeling out on the early read. I have really loving cyclops i also have a good variant for him i have yeah. good variants for a bunch of these which is one of the reasons it's so fun I think to I come back all, i think i have all the cyclops variants i didn't purchase single one i just cyclops? i think i just opened them i you have the omega one where he's got the laser all around yes him. that's the one i have split the most times yes incredible that, it's incredible. an amazing one so can i trade I, you when can we uh, trade variants yeah i think they're i think they're coming out that feature soon second uh, dinner yeah. any day any day but so do you run the full list it makes deck building very tight or are you cutting some people so yeah, I, I mean I've played around with a couple different things. I think it's I think it's too tight when you have all of those because that's that's seven cards plus it really doesn't evolutionary give you much tech outside is eight. Yeah. So then what are your four build around cards, right? Yeah. Uh Luke Cage, Hazmat. I mean, there's some things you can do, right? It's where you want to go. Especially because all now in. with straight mirror matches, you have to bring Luke Cage. And so that's yes. taking up another spot. Yep. So I think that's tight. I the deck I've been playing the most. Um you know, I got it from another content creator and I've I've been playing with it after I played around with a couple of things. Uh, essentially builds around, again, Hulk, She-Hulk, uh, Moon Girl, and you're just trying to get kind of that really big end game. But I've got in that list, I've got Wasp, Misty Knight, uh, Shocker Cyclops, but I'm skipping out on Thing and Abomination, right? Nice. Um, not because those aren't good. I think I'm just going for that end game of She-Hulk, Hulk. Hulk. Uh, yep. Not trying to kind of split my cards between Abomination and Hulk, which I've seen people do, right? Yeah. Uh, you can do that. What have, what have you been trying out? I've been pushing way harder for the A-bomb, so I'm going full debuff style with uh, Scorpion, Hazmat as enablers, and then we are actually cutting Misty, Knight, and Shocker in my lists to be able to run 
more of these pieces. I was losing out to Galactus. So just to say, screw you to Galactus, I brought Debris, who also does synergize with the Hazmat and then providing an addition the rocks as guaranteed targets for me to be able to ping off. And I've got the Sunspot in there as well. Um, so I'm trying to kind of straddle the archetype and be able to have both A-Bomb and Hulk as my finishers. I've had a lot of success with it. It's actually what I'm bringing into a tournament tomorrow. So I'm pretty hyped for that. We'll see. <laughs> how see much how of go. this ladder experience can translate into a tournament play that's where i'm really interested in seeing these different matchups yeah i well i have a question for you um have you been playing at all any um of course now i'm gonna forget the name of the card which i know all these cards by heart uh enchantress oh, yep. uh have you been bringing enchantress at all to try to counter that everybody bringing luke cage no, Imagine. it's rogue. It's rogue. I want to steal oh. it instead. Mm, and it's hard. a little cheaper, yeah. easier to pass. Uh, less power on the body. Also fun to be able to steal their Hulk if that happens, like they were cheating it to the board early. Um, yeah, that was the play that I was going. And I think that's a lot, a lot better in the mirror matches because one, you're getting the benefit for yourself or you know, you don't have to shut it down with an Enchantress where maybe you put down your loot cage there as well or another card that you have to shut off. So yep. yeah, I, I think it's I think it's been a lot of fun. Um there's so much we can talk about just like all the different decks you can build and, and there's a lot of resources on Marvel snaps on and, and other locations and, you know, everybody's sharing their lists online. Yeah. I, my question, which we don't know the answer to, but I want to just talk with you about it is where will this card be when the dust settles, if you will, um, like three, four weeks from now, we will have got some more cards. We're going to start to get all these move cards in June right yep. people. That's going to be the new hotness. Everybody's going to be like, Oh, you know, move. I've never, you know, uh, I would say move doesn't see as much play as a lot of other archetypes, right? And so we're going to yep. see what that happens. Do you think high evolutionary is going to just stay relatively high? Is that your gut feeling? Do you feel like we have any any data at all to back that up at this point? What are your thoughts on where high evolutionary will be long term? Oh, so I'm kind of just kind of mirroring the Thanos release. I think we're seeing him going to receive changes to some of these cards to be able to put power back on his body so that he can actually see play unironically. Um, because it really hurts to have this iconic character that is never going to see the board, especially if they want you to be able to invest in variants on it. You know, they brought Thanos up to be able to see it. And um, I was a little surprised that he didn't have any synergy of being played and then empowering something on the board. Mm -hmm. If they could take away some power of some of these cards, but then when he's played, say it counts as... Um, having passed energy that turn, even if you didn't, or mm. gets a, a, a double effect on one of those cards. I think that could be really interesting. Um, yeah. So my guess is that something like that is going to happen, that they're going to find a way to tune it so that High Evo can get some power back. Because in the reveal, he was a 4-7, right? And they were testing it, and the deck is pretty strong. So they brought him down to the 4-4, and now he's you have to be able to build around having one dead card in your hand, which is also an interesting deck-building idea. It's just it's taking away from him as a character. So yeah. I think he's going to be, I think he's in the meta to, to stay. Maybe not, in, definitely not in the meta share that we're seeing right now. But also as the meta share goes down, I think he actually gets stronger because he's weak, weaker in the mirror match when he has to bring Luke Cage. He doesn't want to have to play Luke Cage himself. He wants to have that space open for extra tech. And so um, for some of the lists that I was running, if I had an extra spot, I would feel even more powerful. Yeah. Yeah, great thoughts. Um, you know, I'm I'm just thinking as, as you're talking, right? I think one of the things that have high evolutionary, you said it at the beginning, right? Similar to Thanos in the sense it just has all these nuances and kind of like you could theoretically put high evolutionary and only bring two or three of these cards if you wanted. Yes. I'm not saying that's good. Oh, there's people who are but... so the, the most prominent one that I'm seeing right now is a lockjaw evolutionary deck. You've got Wasp who's empowered and you've got Hulk who's a big finisher. And that's all people are touching. And so you cycle the Wasp to debuff them and you look to be able to put down that, you know, 16 point Hulk who Hulk was sometimes already getting put in stuff like Lockjaw and Hella. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point. So I think we'll we'll see a lot of those things, right? Like yeah, it may not be you have a full high evolutionary deck, all seven cards that may not last or be what sticks at the top. But I think we'll be able to see high evolutionary play as just kind of this synergy card. You can mix it with other cards. And as more cards come out, you know, there could be other future synergies with this that we don't know about yet that, that yes. don't currently exist. So I think it has a lot of long term potential. It makes me want more cards like this. Uh, I, I don't. I don't know how limited the design space is for cards that add all these cards to your deck or add all these additional abilities to your deck. But I think it's so fun and so unique, right? Because oh, yeah. um, 
you know, as cool as, you know, a card like, I'm, I'm trying to think of the ones that come up the last couple of weeks, Iron Lad. I mean, Iron Lad's super great, but, uh, you know, it's kind of like everybody f- can figure out, okay, this is what it can do, right? Yep. It's very clear, and maybe you put it in different builds, but it's pretty straightforward. This, it could be weeks before people kind of come up with certain ideas that, that stick. So I think that's a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. Um, Anything that is generating the extra cards, especially feels like some of my favorite cards in the game like thor is doing this on a smaller scale hood is doing this on a smaller scale hood my absolute favorite card um but i feel like the design space is really rich for that mm-hmm. on these cards that are nece- like a a weakness that you have to play around hood uh, that then gives you a benefit or uh thor giving you his iconic weapon i think that we could see a whole series of cards that end up being able to play around that i would not be too surprised if we got you know the rest of thor's companions that like generate their own weapons that then have some kind of ultimate synergy here with the Asgardian crew, and that evolves into more of a defined archetype. Is I think that they could just keep on putting out cards like this, and then it makes it really interesting to figure out what pieces you keep, what you love interacting with, what other pieces adapt really well. Yeah, it's very exciting. Yeah, and this is different. That this is just where my brain's going. I, I love the design space with yeah these cards that add new cards to the game, yeah. or you know, or in the match, right into your deck, into your hand, whatever it may be. Uh, or new abilities. I also love cards that add locations to the board. I really mm-hmm. like uh, not so much Rhino. I mean, Rhino could probably use a little bit more love, but like Storm, like that has this unique like location that it unlocks. Yeah. Uh, magic, which obviously you can get Magic's location just in a regular match, but uh, I don't know. I just really enjoy that. I, I'd love to see them do more of that because I think it's just it does something unique that you know you can't get from any other card, right? Yes. Uh, essentially. Yeah. So. I would love to see them do more with that too. The one thing there is that I wonder if they are hesitant to do that because so much of Snap's identity is three random locations. Yeah. And if you can create a deck that's going to consistently give you the same locations every time, it takes away some of that core experience. And so that, that is right now they're point. just they're being very stingy on cards that do that. Like a lot of people have been always saying, what if Shuri just made Shuri's lap? Then it's reciprocal. And I'm like, I just don't think that they want to go the route of making cards make these other locations all the time or like why doesn't kingpin just make fisk tower stuff like this they've chosen to go with like a slightly adjacent route in terms of mirroring abilities but not um locking in a specific location that's a great point i hadn't really thought about in those words but it makes a lot of sense i think that could cause problems because then all of a sudden yeah you have a deck with scarlet witch you know all these other cards and it's like you can just kind of control the locations because you you're almost guaranteed to draw like location altering abilities. If you had six cards in your deck that could all change locations. Right. So, so I hear you there. I think that makes a lot of sense, but just tying it back to high evolutionary, I think it's a very exciting card. Uh, You know, uh, I've definitely been saving some tokens for this one and uh, I can see myself playing this just for the next several weeks. Right. Yeah. Uh, Usually when I find something that I like, I like to stick with it for a little while. I don't, I I jump around a little bit. Sometimes I jump between two or three at a time for a couple of weeks. Uh, But I may just kind of stick with high evolutionary, different builds of high evolutionary for the next couple of weeks. Um, You know, we'll see. Uh, We have a living tribunal next week. and, And then obviously again, all those move cards coming in June. And we know two of them are going to be going directly into series four. Oh baby. And so I think that's going to, you know, creates more accessibility. So all of a sudden, if somebody wants to pick up all four uh, move cards in June, they can. And what is that going to look like? Like, I I don't even know. Like, some of those cards look good, but until we really get them all together and people start playing around with them, there's just, it it could change the whole landscape again. Yes. Yeah, if it finally brings move into an archetype that's viable. Uh, Right now, actually, I do this. If I see someone play a move card, I snap. It's... (laughs) that's it if they play iron fist i'm like all right this should be mine you know yeah. and i i hate to see that because it's one that is a powerful archetype in pool two specifically and so a lot of players who are newer into pool three they see this deck just like completely get no support right um and it hurts a lot of people were having fun with the heimdall moves and wanted it to be able to keep getting tools while they saw all the other archetypes get upgraded so yep. yeah very excited for the cards that are coming out and we are getting uh legion to talk about the location setting he'll set all the locations to the one that he gets played at if the data mine holds true i guess that's actually going to be in june um but we could see some more crazy location shenanigans coming out yeah no i think 
I think that one would be a lot of fun too. Uh, and, and yeah, I, I saw that in my, I didn't, that, that didn't cross my mind, but that will be, but obviously it's, that'll be a little more dependent on what locations flip up. Yes. Yeah, so you're going to have I, to get very creative on. I guess you, you, play, you can play storm and then, uh, you know, uh, play him on anyway yeah that lock it would, all down lock it all down game's over by turn five when everything is flooded you turn to jeff yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh man that sounds like uh lockout lockout's just gonna get better so uh we'll move on here because we're, we're gonna talk more things but we are gonna take just a quick ad break before we continue on here Hey all, I wanted to take a quick moment to talk to you about MarvelSnapZone.com. Marvel Snap Zone is a one-stop shop for everything Marvel Snap on the internet. They have new articles nearly every day that cover deck building, strategy, card breakdowns, etc. They have a great collection tracker tool and a decklist builder that works off of that collection tracker so that you can know what decks you can build with your current card collection. They have guides and deck lists for all level of players and all collection level of players. Make sure to go to marvelsnapzone.com and check it out now. Okay, we are back. So continuing on here, and of course I make us disappear like I do every week. That's just a fun little Easter egg for those watching the video. Uh, we will continue on here. So you and me were talking about this before the show. Uh, with all of the, I won't say drama, it was just like everybody was very focused on the fact that High Evolutionary was not available at the time they expected with how much hype and build up there was. Yeah. Uh, so we were all hyper focused on that for the last couple of days. All of a sudden today, Thursday, OTA patch rolls around and I was like, oh yeah, we do that. I forgot that's a thing. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's that's been happening. Exactly. Didn't, did not uh, remember this was coming. And so, yeah, just so much happening in the last 24 hours of Marvel Snap between these two things. So uh, we'll go over a brief uh, list of the changes here, and then we'll break it all down and see kind of what stands out to us. So Black Bolt uh, is going from a 5.8 to a 5.7, retaining the same ability. Stature is going from a 5.7 to a 5.6, retaining the same ability. Negasonic Teenage Warhead is going from a 3.4 to a 3.5. And Invisible Woman is going from a 2.2 to a 2.3. Uh, we'll just kind of highlight some of the notes the developers gave us on this. Black Bolt and Stature are both kind of targeted at a very strong deck that's been in the meta and had a high cube win rate uh, in the last several weeks. It was really good. It was very good, and I enjoyed playing it. I uh, think it's still playable. Yes. Uh, Wave, the change to Wave in the last couple of weeks also kind of um, weakened that deck, and then this is just kind of the next evolution of bringing that deck down to... And the Rock Slide. Yep, rock slide, bring that down to a more balanced level. Um, so those changes kind of go together. Negasonic, that card's just not seeing quite as much play as they're hoping. Uh, interesting, it's it's additional stats, but yeah. often the card doesn't stay on the board, so that's a little interesting. The softest buff you can imagine, just like the lizard was the softest nerf you could imagine. Yep. <laughs> well, I suppose then, if it is a, a null synergy, right, you still get the point carried over if that's what you're playing fair. towards. That's very fair. And then Invisible Woman, uh, just trying to give her more play and more archetypes. Right now, she's just kind of a one-trick pony normally in like Hella. Um, so maybe Invisible Woman sees a little bit more play in things like Cerebro 3 and maybe some other decks you want to play. So that's kind of the high level of this OTA patch for May 25th. But I want to hear your thoughts, Teddy. What stands out to you and what are you happy about, excited about, etc.? Yeah, so... Anything that's giving something back to Destruction right now, very happy because the Death Wave was broken up. So I've been trying to find something else there. And because she's uniquely a three, I am tooling around with a Surfer list, still trying to get things mm -hmm. right. I don't know if it's there yet, but that's what I'm playing with. Even using Sabretooth, if you can believe it. Listen, if Buffed Venom eats Sabretooth and then Sabretooth comes back to the board and gets buffed by Surfer, it's actually a very efficient play. Um, Invisible Woman right now, incredible as long as the high evolutionary mirror matchups continue you're able to protect your own luke cage guard it from the uh rogue and the enchantress so i actually i posted that as a list as a, a potential way to start using the buff and somebody commented like right away this is the best high evo deck that i've had so far so it's it helps you win the mirror which is very interesting but then of course black bolt and stature youch <laughs> because it feels like these cards just got their time to shine 
yeah. the devs seem to come after this one very quickly. And partly because Haivo has flooded the meta, my recency bias is like, well, this deck wasn't beating me, you know, for the last 48 hours. So <laughs> why are we hitting it, you know? Um, but it did seem very powerful. And then because it's so effective, Snap is in this wild place where just a two card synergy with no other connections in the list at all is viable as long as those two cards are punching up above uh, other pieces. So these mid range decks become very dangerous in revealing what these different modules of point scoring pieces and they can plug and play whatever they want, swap it in, swap it out. I think a lot of other decks were going to start picking this up if they stayed at their stat line. And to keep myself from rambling too much, they were showing the power of being just below Shang-Chi. The, the, the eight and seven is actually a very desirable and very rare stat line rare for a reason here because we saw how much, how powerful it is. You don't, you can play it without worry of get it, anything getting yeah, taken like back. They can't do anything, right? You're, you're safe. Yep. Yeah. Cause things, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about on the podcast, how powerful cost reduction is in Marvel snap. Yeah. Obviously that got fixed a little bit, balanced a little bit with the wave change specifically. Right. Uh, that makes it so you can't quite just like layer all of these cost reductions on top of each other, but it's still very powerful. Um, and so being able to get out these low cost cards that you see, like, like you say, like with kind of this just below the bad stat line, because she Hulk is great, right? But she Hulk yeah. is can be shang chi right? So I think stature, you know, stature, miles, some of these other cards are in a very unique space where, yeah, they don't have that nine, 10 stat line, but you know they're going to be safe wherever you play them on the board, right? Yes, and being able to discount but then not be affected by the Killmonger means that they really do enjoy a lot of freedom. It's only Valkyrie that's coming for them, um, which is pretty pretty wild. I was expecting some changes to come in here, but I expected it to all land on Stature's shoulders. I was kind mm. of envisioning that Black Bolt would remain, and then Stature, because she is just so dead if you don't draw the combo, then maybe she would lose some power, but then also have her base cost come down. Mm. Uh, who, a five six i'm never playing this you know just gonna be dead unless i find my black bolt so still want to test it and see where it lands i see some people are still uh using it some people still brought it in the tournament that i am entered in tomorrow uh so it'll be exciting if i can get that matchup yeah yeah that is interesting it's you know their philosophy often has been what you don't want to nerf things to an unplayable state i think it's going to be a little bit of time before we really see where this lands. I agree with you. I, I think it, it definitely makes stature a harder thing to swallow because yeah, if you, if you don't get it, just you're not playing a five, six on the board. That is just not efficient, right? There's so many yeah. better things you could be doing on turn five or turn six, right? If, if you have to play this for full cost, but, but we have to see where the dust settles because we're in this bubble as we're tying it back to what you said at the beginning, this yep. bubble really makes it. So some of these changes, uh, obviously, you know, you're testing out Negasonic, Invisible Woman, like people are going to be testing it out, but I think yeah. the majority of people are gonna just, just going to be sticking with the, the, the high evolutionary and maybe forget some of these changes exist for a couple of weeks and, and come back to it in a couple of weeks and say, oh yeah, maybe I'm going to try these out now that uh, now that the high evolutionary charm is worn off a little bit. Yeah. So do you think the dust has settled? Or do you think that deck, is, the statuesque uh, Hawk deck is still an outlier? They took a point off of the rock slide. They took two points away here, Black Bolt and Stature. They haven't touched the Miles package yet, and they didn't touch Zabu, which I was a little surprised. I thought they might be taking points away from Zabu as well because he's so so core to holding that list together. If he went down to a 2-1, even a 2-0, I think he could see play. That's kind of my mental thing is like if I look at a card that's really popular, I'm like, hey, if this was a point or two down, would I still play it? And if I say yes, then I get I get worried for its future. Yeah. Um. Again, I'm not playing it. So okay. <laughs> I, I, there's that, did you, right? Did you pick it up at one point? Yes. Yes. Okay. I was, I, I, I played it significantly for a week or so yeah. um, and enjoyed it a lot and, uh, you know, slightly different iterations a little bit, yeah. but um, kind of that core pack, you know, core package that everybody was doing black bolt stature, miles wave, you know, all these things. Um, Hawk, right? Like, uh, yeah, just the good cards, right? Discounted essentially. Yep. Um, yeah, so I think it's definitely like I haven't been playing it as much since some of these changes have started to creep in, and now I'm at a point where I haven't played it probably in a week. Um, 
so yeah, so I, I I guess maybe that's my answer is like, do I want to play this deck in its current state? Not really. All right. So so maybe maybe it has settled. I guess I just because I'm not playing it, I don't know. I don't want to like make a call, but I mean, maybe that's the answer, right? If my if my heart is telling me I don't want to play it, then maybe maybe that's what a lot of people are feeling too, and and that's where it all sit, right? Yeah. My recommendation to people right now is you could go ahead and cut Black Bulls instead. I mean, you could run them if you want to still try and push forward with the deck, but you could cut them and run Wave and Doctor Doom and look just as good, if not better, especially yeah. because the Wave is locking out all these kitty decks that are still around. Yes, yes. And that's a, one of the main things I have been playing uh, is that kitty, you know, kitty and and um, hit monkey and a bunch of other things with kind of low cost card decks. But uh, yeah, everybody's just getting me with that wave. So uh, it's a, uh, it's uh yeah, we're just in a, I feel like, I feel like I just feel scatterbrained because that's kind of in a good way how the meta feels. I think I feel like there's so much happening and yes, we're having this high bubble with high evolutionary. But it just feels like everything's up in the air, yeah. which I think is a good thing. Like you say, yeah. you're testing out these things with Silver Surfer and Destroy and some of these things that haven't seen as much play, right? And yeah. uh, I don't know. Like maybe we're going to see some more Cerebro 3 play with this Invisible Woman change, right? So I just, I think there's so much to that's going on and my brain starts to spin, I think in a good way. Uh, yeah. But it's uh, it's a good time to be a Marvel Snap fan, I guess. Right. It's a great yeah. time, especially with Conquest mode just into next season. That's what's been promised. And it is worth mentioning here, they are committing to keeping up with this cadence of OTA. So you get two OTA patches on either bookends of the season, and then you get the big balance patch in the middle. So the next patch is going to be 6-8. So we're going to have, we get to ride this for a little while. And yes, we get the addition of the next Battle Pass card, and we get the addition of Living Tribunal. Um, but otherwise, things are going to be staying steady. Yeah, that is a great call out. Yeah, that... You know, they were doing the OTA weekly patches kind of on a trial basis through the end of May. They started in April. They have told us that, yes, they're going to keep doing it uh, in the three weeks between larger patches. We're only going to have two OTA patches. So I think that's fine. I honestly thought they were going to cut it back to only one between the patches. Yeah. That was my guess. Uh, just because they said, we're going to give you updates on what we're going to do. And I'm like, well, that means they're doing less. Like, you know, that's that's right, what, right. what I was guessing. But I'm happy because I've loved having these more frequently. I think probably two in every three weeks is a good balance. Yep. Um, and one of the reasons they said that is they want to get more data after they make changes. They need some time to pass so they can get data on, okay, how does this actually change things? If they're doing it every single week, they're probably like one week behind and gathering and assimilating that data and then actually, you know, acting on it. So. Yeah, that's like dog years to other card games in Marvel Snap. Everything's accelerated. The attention yeah. span here is just so, so tight. It is wild. It is actually wild. Yeah. I bet there's plenty of people who are already sick of High Evolutionary, you know, and it came out 48 hours ago. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, excited for, for the continued changes. But I want to talk another thing. Who's your oh, baby? Who is, the, who is the card that you want to see on the buff list on the next OTA? <sighs> that is a great question. Give me about 10 seconds to think about yeah, that. Yeah, well, so mine's easy. I always wear the Punisher headband. I need Punisher over here is criminally behind Captain America. Just, you know, <sighs> yeah, let him be stronger I, for a little bit. I'd love to see it. I would love to see... We have an archetype. I mean, here's the thing is that Move is getting some love. I think that was on the list for a lot of people. Yeah. I didn't see the Move cards come back up. I mean, I'd love to see... I used to play Destroy so much. Yeah. And I, I am not playing Destroy. So, like, if I had to pick a card in Destroy, like, I'm trying to think what it would be. Because, like, Carnage, I don't think you can make any stronger. And, like, Carnage is good, right? It's just, yeah, like, yeah. what is the thing that brings the most value up without making Destroy too overpowered? Mm -hmm. It's know? hard to say. Is it something more to Death? Is it something more to Nimrod as, like, you know, your five yeah. kind of bridge of the gap? Yeah, does Nimrod... Yeah, but is it, do you buff the power on Nimrod? Do you lower the cost? I think you lower the cost, and he becomes yet another build around. You can go like Deadpool, Nimrod kind of shenanigans. But that sounds yeah. like a lot of fun. I mean, why don't we just take it back, you know, to the classic and make Nova get plus two power to oh! every card on the board? No, no that's a bad idea. Uh, <laughs> no, I th I think talking about two card combos that are just yeah, too good. I I could see Nimrod because you know I bought the season pass, but like. Nimrod just I haven't ever been able to make Nimrod fun for myself. Yeah. I know there are some, you know, you can do some shenanigans with uh Galactus, with Destroyer, there's some things, but just 
overall, I want to be able to, I want to be playing cards down. I want to be using Carnage and Venom and things and just like buffing up these cards on the board and like just like getting more powerful the more I destroy, right? That's like what I want to do with yep. the destroy deck. And it just feels like it's still nowhere near where it used to be. Um, so if we go into the data mines just a little bit, we have Phoenix Force. We'll resurrect mm. a destroyed card. Is that the the grail you're looking for as a five cost five five that resurrects a card latches onto it and then allows it to have the vision ability maybe i think i think maybe i think that sounds like a really good card but yeah. just sometimes it's hard for me to grasp when it's like not here and i can't touch it and i can't watch yeah. people play it and i can't for play sure. with it myself but that does sound very powerful but then it, the question is like well what are you trying to destroy and what are you trying to resurrect and yep. what is the best option right because... you almost want to be stingy with what you destroy because otherwise it's random exactly right? so it's, exactly eh. so we'll see how it actually you don't want to resurrect like hood to the board right like <laughs> so it's uh, i guess yeah. it would get would it give you another demon will it re-trigger that on reveal i don't know there's i guess it's I too, mean, maybe, too far out to be able to maybe say. but then like do you want a hood you could move around like i don't know it's... i want a human torch i can move around i'm gonna be killing my own human torch with a oh, killmonger bringing that sucker back and then we're gonna fly places See, that's interesting. That one's interesting. <laughs> Double up after it gave it the plus five. I mean, that yeah. sounds disgusting, but incredibly complicated. Phoenix Force is a four or a five cost in the current? It's a five, five. It's a five, five. Okay. Yeah. It's been different things at yes. different times, and I, I lose track. It but, used uh, to have like explicit synergy with Gene Gray, but now that's been taken away as of the latest. Yeah. And that's the July season pass card. Yep. So, yeah. I mean, so many things coming. Uh, very excited. And like you said, I mean, conquest mode like i don't even know like i think it's going to be great because yeah. right now so you know we have the the best minds here they hit infinite and then they kind of do whatever they want right there's no extra incentive to be number one out there and so that's where the meta constantly changing i think is keeping us from finding what is really the best but if you put the most competitive people in the infinite league and they're trying to get that final infinite ticket, trying to win a gauntlet of friendly battles against each other, I think the deck building innovation is it's going to cut the chaff even faster and we're going to see um, more powerful mm. lists get standardized even faster. Yeah, that's very fair. I'm, so hyped. Exci I'm hyped. excited. I'm excited for that next month. Uh, June June's going to be an exciting one. I want to continue Can on. I come another... back for that episode when we get it on. Oh, yes. I love that. Yes. Yes. I also, yes. I would love to talk with you more about kind of the mentality of like reaching infinite and i think it's going to be even more interesting once we get conquest mode um because i feel like a lot of people like more people in snap than in other card games i've played feel like they should be getting to the highest level um and i think it is attainable i think anybody can make it to infinite here in snap with the setting the setup that they have it's just the uh, the mentality would be fascinating to have a bigger discussion on yeah no i think that'd be a great discussion and i think once you have another mode you yes. can play in right all of a sudden does that feel as important for some players to yeah. try to shoot for the higher ranks, right? Because they're like, well, I no, I'm just a conquest player, right? You have that's happened with other card games, like, oh yes. no, I play this in Hearthstone, right? And exactly. that's the mode I play. Does that happen in Marvel Snap over time? We're like, oh yeah, I don't really play ladder. That's not really my thing. I focus on these modes. Yeah, so. yeah. Well, I hope it really helps because friendly battles, I think, is a great idea. And I always stream a viewer match at the end of my streams. I had people in chat just last month say, what is the um, health bar underneath your name? They have not interacted with friendly battles whatsoever because there's no way to match against a rando, you know? Yep. So they designed this mode and then I feel like it's had a weak release. It has facilitated tournaments, which have been amazing. But for average players, their interaction has been very low. So I think Conquest is going to be awesome. Yeah, I think I, I think I agree with that. Uh, one more thing we wanted to talk about the OTA here, uh, which is very interesting. First time um, ever. Yeah, well, so we, was it two weeks ago, I think, we where we had some locations have their chance of showing up yes. uh, reduced. And so we said, oh, great. Yeah, I think we all applauded that, I think. But because I think they that's were the where, ones that spawned rocks. <laughs> yeah, and I think we thought that's where it would stop, you yeah. know, or maybe they would do the same thing with maybe another location or two. And there's been this very uh, ongoing and ever-present conversation in the Discord and with the developers of, are you going to make any more of these locations that make it so I can't play the game? And they've said through Twitter, but you know, through Twitter threads, discord posts, etc. Hey, we don't have any more currently that we're making that have this feel and vibe and effect where it kind of just locks you up from playing in a different uh, case or scenario. Um, we're doing other things. 
I did not expect this. So for those not watching, I'll kind of explain what has happened if you haven't read this yet. They have temporarily removed three locations completely from the game. So you will not see those locations at all. And they have said, we are going to come back and change those locations, make their their effects completely different, and then relaunch them into the game at some point. So these are Plunder Castle, which only uh, cards that cost six could be played there. The Sandbar, which cards with abilities cannot be played here, so you can only play cards without abilities, uh, which definitely has anti-high evolutionary synergy, <laughs> or had. Uh, and then Milano, turn five is the only turn cards can be played here. Um, which I was surprised. I mean, Milano just came out like last week, right? Yes. So I was very surprised to see that. So what are your impressions of this? Do you think, did you expect anything like this at all? Or do you like this? Uh, do you like this approach to try to kind of reduce some of this friction that people are feeling with locations? Uh, yes, I was also feeling the pinch of just a lot of locations coming up and I was like, oh, and now I'm just locked into this game. And it was really accentuated with the location lockdowns decks becoming more popular. So this is a indirect, very indirect nerf to cards like Spider-Man and Storm, the decks that are able to really capitalize on locking things down. If they were getting assistance from something that was already on the board, they could really run over you. And so here, keeping things a little bit more opened up, I do like there are still plenty of things that are still locked down. Um, and I believe that they are still like, my guess is they're not going to do this very often. Mm. I don't know, getting consistent reworks, I think would be kind of fun. But also you come to associate like so immediately the ability of locations. They've never done a rework for locations before. I thought they were just going to tune up like how rare they were, uh, which is another way to be able to fix the the people who are angry yeah. about them locking out. Um yeah, I was. I'm sad that Krakoa is not on here, but <laughs> yeah, I, I am fine to see any of these go. I am not particularly attached to the locations. Um, I like the more open boards. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you there. Um, I expected, yeah, if anything, they were just going to reduce the rotation of these locations, uh, like they did, you know, in the last OTA patch. Uh, so that was what I was expecting, but. I think there's something to be said. I think the pool of like locations you can't play into has just got very high. Yeah. Right? We, we have, we've had months of just more and more of these locations coming out over the last several months. And we already started the game with things like this, right? Uh, with uh, obviously the game started with um, Sanctum Centorum and others, right? So it's domain. Yeah. Death's domain. I mean, those have been around for a long time. So uh, I think, you know, I think this is a wise decision. Obviously, the developers know what they're doing. They have the data. You know, maybe I'd be curious. You know, every time they do little patches, they give us these little notes of like, oh, you look at that kind of data and that statistic. And oh, that's interesting, right? Yeah. I, I would assume they have data that they can see. Oh, when this location pops up, people that normally were winning lose the game more or they retreat more often or things like that, which maybe they can kind of read into like, okay, if everybody's retreating when these locations are up, even if it's only five or 10% more. It yeah. kind of says people are enjoying the game last, right? Yeah. And, this, and are... the stat that you need to read is at the infinite players, is there ever an immediate retreat after seeing this location flip? Yeah. <laughs> That'll tell you who what people really hate. Yeah. So I'm assuming my guess would be they have the, you know that on some chart somewhere, little data they can see all of this going on. And so maybe that led to these locations specifically, being yeah. the ones that are changed. Um so you guys yeah. in the comments will have to let us know. They're coming back with new abilities. What are thematic abilities for these three locations? I'm not comic pilled enough to be able to rattle them off. So let us know in the comments. Yeah. I mean, Milano, like, you know, it was something with the Guardians of the Galaxy. So I'd love to see something like maybe if if both you and your opponent play there, like maybe both cards get a buff or something, right? If like you yep. both play on the same turn, I think that'd be really interesting. Oh, yes. Right? So kind of like well, that. Do you want it if you ability. both play there, you get buffed, or if only you play there, you get the buff? Uh, yeah. Have you ever played a Sushi Go Party? It's the... Yes, um, yes. It's the... Oh, what is it? <laughs> There's the one card that if you flip it, you keep it, but if multiple people flip it, it has to get discarded. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I have the I have the mini version, of, but I okay, played the larger yeah, version yeah. of the game that has that, but I am less familiar yep. with the cards. But yes. Yeah, essentially that, right? Like it's miso, miso the, soup. The the risk, right? Yes. Um, so yeah, I, I'd love to see something like that. That's the only one I can really speak to. The other two, I'm like, uh, <laughs> do something that's castley, sandbar -y, yeah. you know. Give uh, me loot. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it'll be interesting to see. Um, 
they gave us no timeline, uh, at least to my yeah. knowledge, on these returning. And they've been really only introducing, you know, two locations a month at this point. So, like, are these going to be locations that come in kind of in that way where there's, you know, one every two weeks? And so, yeah, we already know the locations coming in June. So, like, are these like July, August, somewhere later? Or are these just going to come in back in in one big uh, patch at some point and say, oh, yep, here they are again? I don't yeah, know. I kind of expect that because they are slowing down the cadence of the new locations, that gives them an opening to slot these in when they have other uh, more thematic locations planned for a specific season. And then I think they're still going to try and do it one at a time to get the featured location and then some feedback on the changes out of that when it's like the, the more hot location. That I think they look at that pretty heavily for the data. Yeah. Yeah. So interesting change, interesting update. Like we said, just a lot of news kind of going on in the Marvel Snap world uh, in the last couple of days. So, uh, that is our last topic, but just kind of before I close out, I just kind of want to get your general feelings, Teddy. Just, uh, I mean, we've alluded to our feelings kind of throughout the episode here, but just how are you feeling about kind of where we're at with all of the latest cards, the latest patches, the balance patches of their cadence going forward, what we know about the next couple of months of Marvel Snap? Where is your hype level? Any concerns you have about where we stand in the Marvel Snap universe? Yeah, so concerns is still like the cadence of the cards dropping, the way that that was set very arbitrarily in the last drop and kind of undid what people were expecting the cadence to be. Didn't feel good to me. Um, so I hope that we get a more clean roadmap from the developers and some communication there as to what to expect. Just if there was more upfront communication as to what was happening because there were so many, I was, and all my buyer guys was like, hey, wait on, you know, Nolan Hawk. And so I'm sure that people, there were plenty of people who waited uh, not just they were listening to my advice, but general advice in the community. And then they're like, oh, well, I should have bought them at the full price. And then I could have enjoyed them for longer and stuff like that. Yeah. Otherwise, I think I love the idea of how they're starting to push new cards directly into Series 4. The <laughs> We had to pay 24,000 tokens to be able to get all the cards this season, 12,000 next season. That's yeah. 50% cut. That is, like people were talking about economy changes. That's insane. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> especially at the monetary value of a token like the second dinner is taking a hit here as to Man. what they're making to be able to bring this to us so i'm loving that and then oh we've got the rumblings on the missions and <laughs> for the weekend missions that people are pretty unhappy with because they're gonna highlight rebates to people who are paying players versus the free to play i just feel like there's better optics on ways they can do that and yeah. I- <laughs> It was a strange choice on how they they sent that messaging. I don't think it's that bad. I'm not as much of a doomer on that change as I think some people were, but I just can't help but feel like there's better optics on a way that they could adapt to that as well. And then with Conquest right around the corner, I'm a happy man. Um, And yeah, very excited there. Yeah, I think I agree with a lot of things you said. I think with a new mode so close, I mean, weeks away at this point, right? Uh, I think for people that maybe are feeling like that Marvel step burnout or just like, want to keep playing but they're looking for something new i think it just brings in a whole new way for people to play and people to stick with the game and again like it's like you could focus on that and not focus on what has been the way people play marvel snap traditionally yes. right yeah um so i think that's just the maturity of a game growing you know and it's uh you know not full first year of being fully released but first you know full year since the beta right uh we hit our one year anniversary with the podcast this week so it's like yeah. it's been one year since the beta started right so uh kind of crazy um to see yeah and with the new mode because it seems to be geared to be very competitive i feel like that can open up space to make getting infinite more accessible and then the ladder grind not feel as grindy really, because then once you hit infinite, you can transition to playing more conquest mode matches and see how far you can climb there while keeping up with your dailies and doing deck testing at infinite on ladder. I think that could be a great balance that they could find there. Um, Because right now it feels like the ladder experience appeases no one. (laughs) The really competitive players reach it within a couple days and then they just play casual and look for tournaments and other things to satiate their thirst for competition. And then other players who don't have as much time to be able to invest in the game or what have you just feel like the ladder grind is forever and they can't get ahead yep yep man it must be hard being a game developer because uh uh i you know i think it was said by um dan and nina who were on the podcast a couple weeks ago they're just like i'm a card game player i'm never happy right like you know uh, that's supposed to be it's the culture 
yeah yeah so. i uh i did a parody of the honest trailer videos for marvel snap like back in the beta and one of the jokes i used was that ben brode's balancing philosophy is to swing the nerf bat until the reddit stops crying the secret is the reddit never stops crying <laughs> very very true yeah. uh well thank you thank you again so much for being on today it was great to talk about so many exciting things uh you know we've already got you scheduled now for the conquest episode yes. so yes. we will we will be having you back on in a few weeks um but i want to just give you a second as always to give the listeners a shout out of where they can find you and support your content yeah so i'm primarily on youtube at teddy ninja i stream on twitch monday wednesday friday and youtube monday wednesday friday at teddy ninja 15 always jamming new decks covering the new cards releasing deck guides trying to be every day and then i'm hoping to work in some more tournaments so i'm competing in the snap offs tomorrow well, I don't know when this is releasing. <laughs> Check the it, VODs for the tournament matches if you want to hear how yes, I did. It will be re- you will be playing the tournament the day this releases. Exactly, so, exactly. Yeah. We need to listening match to this sometime. We have yeah. never gone head to head. Yeah, well, I've been on your stream multiple times and I'm like, well, maybe uh, he always plays against somebody at the end. Maybe I should stick around, and, but then I always have to jump off. Nah, just I... shoot me on Discord. We'll set up something. Okay, sounds yep. good. Okay, awesome. Well, listeners, thank you so much for listening. As always, let us know your thoughts online and we will... Uh, We're excited to hear, you know, how you're playing with High Evolutionary, how you're enjoying Marvel Snap in the current state, and we will catch you in the next episode. Thanks. Keep on snapping. Can't Stop Snapping is a podcast written, recorded, produced, and hosted by Michael Thurman. Thanks for listening. Thank you.